Welcome everybody uh, again at the Atelier Düsseldorf Theater der Welt in collaboration with ITI Germany. Um, we have a panel today and thank you for your patience on uh, festival making in a time of COVID-19, the good, the bad and the ugly and uh, like the hybrid model that we are experiencing here which has some challenges sometimes. Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome our four speakers. Vigdis Jacobs, Dottir from the Reykjavik, Reykjavik Arts Festival in Iceland, Faisal Kiwewa from Bayimba Arts Festival um, in Uganda. Uh, both are here with us in person, and then two online mentors who will join us today, Rania Elias from Yabuz Cultural Center in Palestine, and Natalia Machiavelli, who is uh, from Mid Sao Paulo in Brazil. So delighted to have you with us. Uh, the panel will be facilitated by Mike van Graan, uh, and I will hand over now to Vigdis Jacobs Dottir, who will uh, talk to you from Düsseldorf um, in person and online. Hello, everybody. Um, what a privilege it is to be here in person. What a privilege it is to be um, a European culture worker that has steady funding. Um, what a privilege it is to share this space, virtual and real, with people from around the world. Um, I, I think the world for um, this period in the past has been grateful and has to be grateful for what we have in spite of everything. Um, I am artistic director, as Inge said, of Reykjavik Arts Festival. Um, and what you see here on the slide is the logo of the festival. It's been running since 1970, and the logo has remained the same, although it changed for a while, but then we brought it back to basics. And um, it symbolizes, I like to start with explaining the logo because it symbolizes very much what the festival stands for. Uh, the center, um, the core, the, the big uh, shapes in the middle symbolize, um, according to the graphic designer, um, um, the mountains around Reykjavik, the steady, the old, the traditional, the, the, the uh, conventional, if you like, and then the, the bows that make it into almost like a flower uh, represent new growth, represent in particular the flower of the chickweed which is like the, the smallest weed that grows and blooms in our gardens and uh, around. And so it's um, a combination of grassroots level arts and the big institutions, the, the more traditional culture, if you like. So um, a little bit of context, because context is queen, I've found. It's so important to, to know which context you're in every time. Um, and uh, just to explain, you know, uh, I presume most of you at least know where Iceland is on the map, but not necessarily. Um, and I, there's an arrow to help you see. Uh, it's a tiny little rock, really, in the middle of the North Atlantic. We're um, bombarded with storms and horrible weather all year round. So it's an extra privilege to be here in the warm weather in Germany. Um, and... Uh, really isolated physically from the rest of the world. We're, in, we're the in between America and Europe. And um, for a long time, we were very, very poor. Uh, and we were colonized by Denmark and Norway and Denmark again. And we got our independence, our final independence, actually on the 17th of June, 1944. So today is Independence Day. It's holiday in Iceland today. Um, so we are, um, and after that, and after the World War, we became more prosperous, and um, we are now considered like a prosperous, rich country, really, because we have many uh, resources. But uh, when the festival was established in 1970, there was very little, uh, by the way, of um, culture, international culture. And um, the festival was, uh, came, it, it had, had like a prehistory of, Icelandic artists wanting an international festival in the country. Um, but um, uh, Vladimir Askenazi was then, we had a symphony orchestra by then, and Vladimir Askenazi, the famous pianist, 
um, concert pianist and conductor was um, actually um, married to an Icelandic, and is still married to an Icelandic woman, and they um, uh, and he was living in Iceland at this time, and him together with Icelandic Union of Artists, city and state, and the Nordic House, which had just been established in Iceland, founded the festival in 1970, and from day one the artists have been very high level. So what you see here is one of the concerts from the very first festivals, and this is Led Zeppelin on stage. So, um, so and the same festival we had, Jacqueline Dupre, the cellist. And so it's been very like high profile, A-list um, festival from the very beginning. Um, and once, when I, I took over, no, 2016, uh, and, um, the festival is biannual. It was actually it had been annual for a few years before that, but but from the beginning it was biannual. So it's every other year, and they had just made the change. The board had just made the change to make it biannual again when I took over, and I was so happy to enter at that stage. And we um, decided to read the the let's say the festival was in a little bit of identity crisis at that time because. There had been a boom, we had a new concert hall, there was a boom of international events happening year long in Iceland. Festivals, also a festival boom. We had, uh, there are like 50, 60, 70 festivals in Reykjavik now of all kinds. So it wasn't anymore the festival of festivals, the main festival, the only festival. Still very much the, the main festival in the sense that it's supported by city and state. But, it's, um, but it's, it had like an identity issue. And uh, we readdressed the purpose and the mission and the vision of the festival uh, alongside the whole of the culture field in Iceland because we collaborate with everybody. And um, actually the core, I've realized through the years since I took over, the real, the real core of course in the mission is this sentence which, has to, which says, arts and culture are not to be reserved for the privileged few but are a right for all. This is the role of the festival today, to reach out to audiences which are not generally um, um, privileged with a lot of um, uh, culture and cultural events in their neighborhoods, in their towns, because we also reach out to outside of Reykjavik, and um, for some reasons, um, uh, financial or other, are not, have not, do not have access to arts. Um, but we're here to talk about our reaction to COVID. And uh, but this was the context. So just so you know that this has been the journey in the past years. We've gone from maybe, and we still are very much, we work with the symphony orchestra and the opera, and we are very much like um, work on that level as well. But more and more, we're um, entering into the outreach sphere, if you like. So uh, when COVID hit, um, we uh, were in the situation where we had, this is, so this is March in Iceland, March 2020. And we were in the situation uh, that we had the full program ready. We were actually designing the 100-page catalog of events, and a very intricate, uh, intricately woven um, uh, uh, program with um, all sorts of events, 100 and something events. And uh, we had actually made, we had negotiated with every single artist of the festival, and then we, were, we realized we were not going to be able to to execute it. And I, my inbox was flooded with cancellations of other festivals and events, and I just couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand the thought of saying, all of this that we've spent two years preparing is now cancelled. And I said, whatever we do, we're not going to cancel. So we, so our whole sort of, then we, for a couple of weeks, we were exploring ways, how can we actually execute the festival, stand by the artists that we have programmed, um, not take away their opportunities and not um, betray our audiences either of their live arts. Um, so um, the slogan of the festival became not cancelled and um, we decided uh, to extend it over a full year. And at that time, I didn't know whether I would have the staff to do this because my staff was hired until June, the main group of the staff. Um, or the money or the possibilities. We didn't know how long COVID would last, but everyone thought it would be over by the end of the summer, as you remember. <laughs> um, so we, uh, but we made this decision and I said, well, so we, we, we scrapped the 100 page catalog and we made a little um, brochure with all the program, every single event 
was we negotiated with the artist and we said, we're going to do this, we're going to honor the contract with you, but we don't know when. So are you, a, are you prepared to do this with us? We'll launch the full program, but without dates. And that's what we did. So we launched on the same day as we intended to, but with the difference that we didn't uh, set a date for any event. <laughs> Uh, and this has been a journey, I tell you. <laughs> so since then, we've been slowly offering the events of the festival when there are gaps in the COVID infections and in between the waves of COVID. And um, so we're, some events have had five different dates because we are having to postpone again and again. Um, some, we, well, actually quite a few we've managed to do. And this uh, strange looking picture shows um, the core events, the main events of the festival, and the blue uh, uh, boxes are the events that we've done. So this is what we have been able to offer. And this is everything from um, uh, events where one by for, for one audience at a time to um, big scale 800 people concerts. So it's, uh, we've sort of been able to squeeze them in in between. But the yellow boxes are events that we've now decided to postpone until the next edition of the festival, but they're still part of the program. And the red boxes are the unfortunate ones where we've had to cancel, but then we paid the artist at least um, half of their fee, sometimes the full fee. So it's, um, uh, yeah. But the, I would never have thought we would have been in this position today, to be honest. But um, there we go. So we have a lot of events already programmed for the 22 edition. Um, but COVID brought gifts for us in the sense that it, um, in, in all of this struggle and in all of this hard work that we've had to do with the rescheduling and postponing, there have actually appeared opportunities that we've decided to grab. And one of them is that this old theater that you see um, the photo of here is um, it's called Idno. And uh, it's uh, run by, this is where we were going to have our festival hub and did have our festival hub. It was um, closed, well, actually the people running it went bankrupt. So we, um, the city, which owns the building, offered the festival to run the theatre for the whole summer. And this is, of course, in the middle of COVID, but Iceland was in a really good position in June, July of 2020. And we were able to keep our festival hub open for those couple of months. And um, this was an opportunity to explore, to go down a path which is not normally possible for the festival. So what we did was that we said, we offer um, co arts collectives to um, have takeovers of the festival. So uh, of the festival, yes, but of the space, of the hub. So we gave them money and we gave them a space, this space, the whole building for a week or sometimes two weeks um, and we said, you curate the space, you, you do what you like with this money and this space. We trust you as an arts collective to do this. And for me, this became um, like a mind blowing experience where we really felt that um, when you trust artists, when you just uh, artists and also groups, these were like drag. Um, this was a drag collective. This was a, um, a very young arts collective where some of them are uh, from, from the age of 16 to 20 something and the house was filled with people who are um, uh, much younger than we normally see at the festival. So we finally reached an audience which is very hard to get. Um, also um, immigrants and um, um, yeah, we, a circus company took over for a week. It's been, it was a real journey and we realized that time is so valuable in uh, the arts. And I think this is one of the gifts that we take away with us is to give, allow ourselves more time because we will harvest um, more when we um, uh, give time and the space. And this is a photo of one of the performances from the drag group. Another gift of COVID, if you like, another opportunity that we decided to um, grab was a uh, Helsinki festival in Finland. They developed a concept called Art Gifts and it's basically um, a website, a web application where you can order um, an art gift for someone you love and the art gift is in the form of a performance, of a live performance of one or two artists that come to your doorstep 
in your garden, outside your house, or even inside your house if it's considered safe. And this was a direct COVID reaction from uh, Helsinki. And at first, when I heard about it, I thought, no, this is, this is not going to, we don't need this in Iceland. We're in a better situation. But then autumn came, and we had a really hard wave of COVID where everybody, we were in sort of semi-lockdown for the whole autumn, more or less. And then we said, we'll do this. We'll use the money that we couldn't use to, for the festival hub because we had to close one month early there. And we got permission from the city to use that money to develop this project in Iceland. And, and uh, we sent all sorts of artists, African drummers, drag queens, opera singers, violinists uh, around the city. And this was um, in the first edition. We did two editions. Um, the first one was in the city, and we went into all the neighborhoods of the city, um, offering, uh, it was 140 art gifts, so people could order, and they were um, free, so anyone could order them, and the, it was so important to distribute them over the city, also to the less prosperous suburbs, um, and within a couple of hours, this was presented on television on the main culture program, and within two hours, everything was bu fully booked, and um, we experienced such beautiful moments of um, like cancer, cancer patients who hadn't been able to uh, hug their family for weeks or months. And then um, maybe the daughter ordering um, an art gift for her mother, for her sick mother. And then um, famous, and these were all really famous artists in Iceland appearing on below their balcony. And there were such um, beautiful moments. And I think the real beauty of this project it's actually, this is the website, sorry, the, uh, um, is the fact that you, someone is giving another person this art gift. That's where the magic lies, not in the performances as such, although they're want wonderful, of course, but it's, uh, it's more the fact that someone has taken the time to order this art gift for you and taken the responsibility that you are home and they're there to witness it as well. So there are like really... There were so many tearful moments, like this mother and daughter, for example, who got um, a couple of musical uh, singers, and by coincidence, they didn't know what they got, so it's, it was a um, surprise. Um, by coincidence, they love musicals, and they, you can just see the happiness. The mother never stopped crying, <laughs> and I start tearing up when I talk about it, because it w I witnessed this one, and it was just um, amazing. Um, and, and COVID gave the context for this to really have like poignant power. So I'm really grateful to Helsinki Festival. We also managed to do, these are circus artists speaking to people in an old people's home through a window. Um, but, but this, um, this uh, project um, gave us an opportunity to reach out also on a bigger scale because in December we were in semi-lockdown as well. And the Minister of Culture decided this just shows how privileged we really are to put money into offering this to the whole country. So we ended up running this huge project with 750 art gifts, artists traveling in the middle of winter, flying, driving um, around the country in snowstorms and blizzards to deliver these art gifts to the most remote parts of the country, which never get anything like this, really. And... Um, and like the most famous rappers in Iceland were performing in the Northeast and the most famous pop star, like glam rock pop star, was performing in the North and, and people were so um, grateful and surprised that it, it, yeah, it was just mind blowing. And the art was, because it's, and, and like the walls that we normally trying to break, they just, it's like they never existed. It was, but it, it cost money this, but it was so worth it at this time. So I've spoken, um, I'm about to finish, but I, I've spoken about these gifts and I think um, um, opportunities, when, when we are as culture organizers, as festival managers, when we um, are faced with something like this crisis, we need to be brave enough to think outside of the box and really go for it. Um, I think the, the most dangerous um, decisions we made were the best ones the ones that could have gone all sideways and all wrong turned out to be the best decisions we made in COVID. And I think um, it's been a reminder of taking time and going slow and going deep. And I think for the strategy of the future, we're now developing a strategy for the next um, four years. And we are um, 
really thinking about how can we engage at a deeper level, not just with our audiences, but also with our artists. And this makes sense from an environmental perspective, but it also makes sense from an artistic perspective. And um, from a mental health perspective as well for everybody, because we, we just need to take deeper breaths and, um, and work slower, I think. I think that's one of the um, big revelations of, of this trying year. Thank you very much. Mm, thanks, because, yeah, I think um, if COVID has done anything, it is to slow us down. Um, and yet, in some ways, it's also <laughs> helped to pick other kinds of projects up and, and make us work incredibly fast as a way of trying to respond to the impact of COVID. So uh, thank you for that, for that brilliant introduction and, and reminder for us to, to slow down a bit. What we're going to do is we're going to take all of the speakers in this particular panel, and then we'll come back and have a conversation with the panelists and take questions. Um, so thank you very much, Victor. We'll now move on to Rania from Palestine. She'll be followed by Faisal, and then Natalia from Brazil will um, end the panel for us. Thank you, Mike. Um... Okay, can you see the slide now? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Rani Elias. I'm the director of Yabuz Cultural Center and the director of the Jerusalem Festival since 1998. Um, just to give a brief information about the Jerusalem Festival, um, the Jerusalem Festival started in 1995. It is organized in Jerusalem every summer. It's an international festival, which is every year it has a specific slogan or theme. And we invite artists uh, from different parts of the world. It's a performing arts uh, festival, so it is a combined of several um, issues and uh, several kind of uh, arts between music and dance and so on. Um, if, if, if somebody knows what Yabus means, uh, I will try to give as well uh, information about Yabus. Yabus is the first name of Jerusalem 5,000 years ago. Uh, and we named our institution Jer uh, Yabus um, because it's the first tribe who came to Jerusalem and uh, we need to have uh, the relation with our history as well in, in the city. Well, with COVID, it's the same everywhere. It is the first maybe in our uh, life that we share something together all, all around the world. It was a surprise within one day everything is different so we here in palestine as well everything was closed and we had to close our center and to stop all our events on the 15th of march 2020. it is a surprise but as well we have to deal with it it was a radical change for us uh, and we have to move and to do something the year of it was a year of evaluation and reordering of things in different manners and methods we were forced and with no other option to adapt to new situations imposed by the spread of COVID. and therefore we had to rearrange our home our programs our plans our work in different ways of dealing with the cultural situation and Rania, we didn't... Rania. <coughs> Sorry, yes. Rania. Um, I wonder if you can maybe show it in slide format, slideshow format, just so that yeah. you can maybe fill up the whole screen. Thanks. Uh, just one second. Uh... Mm. You go to uh, the top yeah. bar, you'll go to the yes, slideshow. Yes, there yes, we go. yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, from the current slide, just take it from the current yeah. slide. That's it. Yeah, yeah that's it. Thank cool. you. Thank you. 
This is one of the problems of technology, actually. <laughs> so our plans, our work, everything have uh, been changed and we have to deal with it in a different way. Even traditional and creative ways of dealing with a cultural situation have become inappropriate. Even here in Palestine, we were placed in a situation where cultural institution and programs were the first sector to be closed and the last sector that returned to its normal status. For us in Palestine, it wasn't really a big surprise uh, to cancel a festival or an event. Uh, actually, I don't want to say we are used to this because of the pol political situation. We are not used to it, but we had to deal with it and adapt with the situation. We have went through different crises in postponing our festivals. In, in 1996, the first festival was planned to have more than 400 artists uh, in different locations and so on. And then a political situation happened in Jerusalem. The Israeli occupation started digging tunnels under Al-Aqsa Mosque and the whole festival was canceled after more than one year of preparation. In 2014, we had to go into the same situation again. The festival was planned on the 10th of July, 2014. On the 2nd of July, uh, a teenager called um, uh, Mohammed Abu Khder was kidnapped, burned, and murdered by Israeli settlers. And everything was canceled after more than one year of preparing the festival because the situation in Jerusalem was very tense. In 2017, on the night of opening the festival, where we had all groups coming from the United States, from Spain, from Sweden, from France, we had to cancel the festival the opening night after everything was planned because they, uh, they decided to put detectors around Al-Aqsa Mosque and an uprising was happening in Jerusalem and we canceled everything. So. Canceling a festival in 2020 was a difficult decision, but as well, we had to cope with it in a different way. Besides all that, on the 22nd of July, 2020, during the corona and during the closure, our Yabus Cultural Center was raided by the Israeli occupation. I was arrested, interrogated, and they confiscated all our devices and documents. In terms of work, workflow, Yabus have done its best to comply with the 2020 action plan, but faced several obstacles. Amendments have been made and took into account the situation, the arrest, the confiscation of equipment and devices, and several closures and lockdowns in the city. In that conditions, we, have, we had a heavier workload than before the quarantine. In a direct response to the condition, we have developed and established alternative initiatives for youth, children, and partner community organization by encouraging and supporting online intervention and using digital platforms to engage youth and children at home, storytelling, music performances, film screening. I mean, it was the use of digital and multimedia display has been installed to access, communicate, and share. On the other hand, we managed to deal with the Israeli occupation targeting Yabus and myself and my husband, musician Suhail Khoury, by legal ways, but we are still facing and dealing with the confiscated documents and the arrest as well. 15 of March, we stopped, freeze, we were shocked, but we took a deep breath. We think, we evaluate and try to innovate and then act and then new plans and new experience. After the closure of, of the center, we faced the financial problems. There's no fund for culture. There's no fund for artists. There's no fund for institutions. So after six months of rem remotely working and the result of different difficulties and financial needs, the service of our major four employees at Yabus were terminated as a result of the current situation. Our four festivals were canceled. The Jerusalem Festival in July, Al-Quds Popular Art Festival in October, Al-Quds Storytelling Festival in November, and Christmas market and events in, in December as well. But we took our time 
and took the initiative and well, as well. We took a break and we reviewed our internal regulations, our annual plans and programs, and the restructuring of our work, management team, and staff. We hold bi-weekly meetings by the board of the director of Yabus and staff, which was a very strong involvement of everyone. Participating with local and international cultural institutions online with conferences, interventions, film screenings, literature, literary seminars, and musical performances. We maintained the relation with our public through different artistic programs using social media on live, online, and live streaming. We looked for new supporters and new ways of supporting Yabus. We faced the major financial problems, mainly the rent and the property taxation, and we faced the latest harassment by the Israeli occupation. Who is the festival for? I, I mean, in 2009, we had, beside the four festivals that we organized, we had organized more than 300 uh, 96 programs and events. Our audience was around 72,000 people. But in 2020, our direct and indirect audience are much, much less. It's 47,000, around 47,000. With our audience, there was no real interaction. There was no ambiance of the place to go for, to socialize, to go to the venue, see people, interact. It's about communication, which we missed in 2020. Our events was open to all segments of society. In 2020, we couldn't reach them all, especially children and youth, because some of them have limited, limited and good access, no good access to internet. And as well, the restriction of movement, because we didn't move uh, around. In regards to sustainability, we, we didn't manage to keep our partners. In Palestine, priorities goes to health and as well to shelter and food. So nobody was asking about supporting a festival or a concert or an online event or so on. Even the government, we didn't have any fund for organizations or for artists or for initiatives no donors at all. Artists were left alone to face the problem. There was no concert, no festival, so there was no income. On the technical side, we, in our country, we don't have an uh, IT, I mean, a strong infrastructure. And not each house has a computer or a laptop or more than a computer or a laptop. So the resources is very limited. Not everyone was able to attend all the digital or be part of the, this digital platforms. On the, same, on the same issue as well, there was so many productions, especially songs that were prepared uh, and were registered and were uh, recorded by telephones. And they produced so many beautiful songs by the young generation in, in specific. For 2021, we are back. We will be having our festival from the 7th to the 14th of August. We are affected in regard to productions and services uh, for this year and I think for the years to come. There was an adjustment of the, our program ambitions as well. Very limited funding. There was a reduction for, from public and private funding, limiting staff, and concentrating mainly on local production and arts. This is mainly our, uh, our situation. Nevertheless, we are doing our best to continue our work. Some of the issues that we faced in 2020, we can take with us and continue our work for 2021. We missed the venues. We missed re seeing people, interacting with them. We missed the ambiance of the light and the sound and the artist on stage and interaction between artists and the audience. We missed going out to public spaces and enjoying ourselves and learning 
and knowing about different kind of productions. But that at the same time, we learned a lot from 2020. We have taken so much lessons in reducing the budget, in restructuring, in, in a way of working, but as well, as much as we loved uh, the connection between people in 2020 through social media and all these system, but we hope we will not be obliged to use only this way of connecting people together, especially for arts and culture for the years to come. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rania. And certainly those of us who've attended the atelier in the past, we would much prefer to be even in very hot Dusseldorf right now, rather than be seeing each other on the screen, because as you say, that's kind of where the real relationships happen. Um, so thank you very much for that input. We'll come back and ask a few questions a little bit later. But uh, to, move, to move on to Faisal um, from Uganda, the Biamba Bayimba Festival director, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Faizo Kiwewa and I'm from Uganda. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. I think it's the first time I am after everyone, as you know, meeting with international colleagues and friends. It's been a tough season and um, I'm very proud that we have managed to achieve what we have achieved today and this week, um, this hybrid version of the atelier. Um, the topic of making festivals in this time of COVID, I think, you know, we've explored it, we've talked about it. But as I was thinking, I was, uh, I was thinking about how to approach it, knowing that we have a lot of young festival managers who are trying to, you know, establish themselves, uh, create uh, new initiatives. I kind of thought to go back to the beginning and maybe to kind of connotate the, uh, the conversation. And my first thought was like, how did we start? And also, why did we start? And where did we start? So my thought was in 2005, in December 2005, I had my last concert as an artist in one of the newly found region oil region in Kampala in Uganda called Hoima. And I felt I was done. I felt I could not do it anymore. And I told my, my manager as I was walking down the stairs of the stage, I told him this is it. And he was like, what do you mean? I'm like, I am not stepping on any other stage in my life as an artist. And he asked me, so what's next? I told him I don't know, but I'll think about it. <laughs> so I took a break of six months. I traveled. I just wanted to formulate my thoughts uh, to know what I was going to do next. So I went to, uh, to Tanzania, and then I got a small gig to do a short documentary film, which was allowing me to travel around the LVB, the Lake Victoria Basin to document the lives of the people who lived around this area. And as I was doing this job, it's a very big lake, the biggest, it's shared by all the East African countries, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, and Rwanda and Burundi. I kind of realized that there were so many people surviving on this lake, but they knew so little about each other. They lived in their own bubbles. The only thing they knew about each other was fishing nothing else, no culture, no collaboration, no exchange. They only survived on fishing. And actually, some of them used to fight with each other when they were asking, why are you encroaching on my fishing area? And it took me back to question my retirement from art. And I'm like, why do I stop being an artist? And I think for me, the issue was, I was not satisfied. 
I was not happy. I always felt like I fell short on my creative process. I always felt like there was no system and structure to support my creativity. And being someone that I wanted to offer more, I felt like maybe it wasn't a place for me, but I needed to do something because when I looked around the industry, I saw there were so many young artists who needed the same support that I was looking for. And I thought that if I don't do something or if we don't do something about it, they might also retire earlier like I did. That's why I started my organization and I started my festival. Just like Ab uh, Abdul Hakim here, who is trying to do something in Bamiyan, in Afghanistan, when I was reading his story, I was like, he is trying to break barriers. I was reading the story of Anaru in Brazil doing the Arab Film Festival for women. She is trying to break barriers. But what does that teach us when it comes to this situation? What is the good about it? I think the good about it is the conceptualization. COVID has given us an opportunity to rethink what we've been doing. Did we do right? Are we carrying the right concepts? Are we doing the right things? Where did we go wrong? What did we miss? And I think the bad news, the bad news about it is the mental health issues that we are facing. And some of us have not realized it, that we are actually sick. We've been so much attacked and most of us have attended so many Zoom conferences, talking to our colleagues, oh my God, when did I see you, or when can we see each other? They don't realize that there is a very big problem artists are facing, at least from my context. Because as I said, just like me, there is no structure. There is no system to support these artists. The level of frustration is so high. And when I wake up as an artist, as a programmer, you get these nightmares. You wonder whether you're still relevant as a programmer. You wonder whether the artist that you support or you work with has given, had an opportunity to have food on the table. You try to do something. I try to give away some food, support some artists. I, I think around 200 artists give them food, but they're like, how long is they, are they gonna survive on that food? So these are some of the situations that we've been facing during this COVID and it's really bad. So the mental health is affecting three categories in our industry. We have the artists who are now starting to question themselves whether their managers were doing right. Because when we talk about artists, sometimes we are very much driven to musicians. Some of the musicians are lucky because for them, they can put their music on iTunes, on Spotify, and they get a paycheck at the end of the day if they get downloaded, you know. But they are filmmakers. They are theatre people, they are visual artists that really need that physical presence to be, to get something in their hands to survive on. How are they going to survive throughout this period? And they are still struggling. So some of these artists decided to fire their managers. They thought they were not really planning for them. And, but who was to blame? Was it the artist or the manager? Yeah, no, one, no, no one saw it coming, but it was happening. And then the second category of the mental health is us, the programmers. We, as I said, trying to question our relevance. We are trying to think, do they really need us? How can we be supportive? But all our hands were tied. And you wake up and you're sweating. You don't know what to do. You can't do anything. You're helpless. It is really, really disturbing. And then we have the audience. The audience is also struggling. Like during the COVID period, we have a space that we try to organize, you know, monthly events, invite around 50 to 80 people because it's open air, it's big enough. But the audience is asking, should I go or should I not go? There's a category, there's also age group of, you know, the old folks who are like, I don't wanna get sick. The young people are like, I want to get out, but I don't want to bring the sickness to my mother or to my father. So they are, they are torn apart. Even if they want to go out there, they, really, they are not sure because they know 
that if they go out there, they might come back and blame themselves for the rest of their lives. So how are we going to deal with these issues and these categories? I think, as managers, we need to be aware of our mental status and also be aware of the people that we serve, the artists and the audiences. How are they reacting? How are they going to be supported? How can we understand them and help them to feel comfortable as we prepare ourselves to move forward? Then the ugly. The ugly part about this COVID is that we got to know who our friends are. And, you know, at least from my context, where I come from, we really got to know who our friends are in times of this. And again, there was no one to blame because we are all in it together. As Rania said, that we all suffered worldwide together. We are all in this boat together. But again, we knew some of our folks who could lend their hand, and they couldn't. They were like, I'm also suffering. And what did, I tell, what, what, what did it take me back? I think for me, I thought about our sustainability. I come from Uganda, where there's only one culture center, which sits around 371 people capacity, and that's it. So it means that with all the events and the activities that go around you know, the city and the country, we are all competing for this one space. And as COVID hit, all the artists that didn't have spaces to work in, they had to shut down, like everyone else. And now, whereas we are getting to try to start again, they have nowhere to start because they have no capital, they have no you know, gigs to perform in, they are shut down. They need to restart, and they have nowhere to start. So within the process, I told my colleagues, and those who are our friends, I told them, you know what? We are going to start building spaces, because we should be aware that once this whole thing is over, a painter, a musician, a theater person, they will all need a, a space to create their work. And there's nowhere they are going to go, because they don't have capital to rent. So I went to my friends, and I told them, this is the deal. Can we invest in this? Because we have time, we have the space, we have the opportunity to make sure that we can prepare ourselves. At least once the crisis is over, artists have somewhere to go. They were like, why? Why do you want a space of your own? Do you want to be independent? Do you, have you considered the cost of maintenance? Have you thought about, uh, you know, how are you going to sustain it? And I, thought, I felt that's a very narrow, you know, thought. So we, con we, we decided to continue to go on and do it ourselves. And we are moving forward. We are trying. I think the ugly part of it is, for us, is going to be the good. And we are so excited to see that we are not just looking at now, but we are looking at the vision of 2040, that we want to build a space whereby in case we get another pandemic, we are not caught off guard. We are prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal, for sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly from your Ugandan perspective. And I think that a lot of people on our continent, you know, what you just shared will kind of resonate with that. So, so thank you for that. The final panelist is Natalia from Sao Paulo. Thank you, Natalia. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you all. Uh, it was very inspiring. I feel already um, this uh, urge also to see you and to hug you. Uh, this is uh, suddenly, certainly something to be recovered after that, all this crisis. But let's Let's go uh, on to my presentation. I am Natalia Machiavelli. I have been working for the Sao Paulo International Theater Festival since 2013. The Sao Paulo International uh, Theater Festival is a festival conceived to show contemporary and radical performances and by established and also emerging uh, theater companies. 
it's um well we, we really believe and want the social and human revolution and this is always in the horizon of the curatorship and the production even in the product even if the production um process can be really stressful the team is very lovely uh, we really love each other and we take care of each other and uh, to to always have this goal in our minds so we don't run over uh, ourselves in this um, very difficult balance between a lot of work and your health i totally agree with pfizer when he says that uh, we are sick we are sick planet uh, there is no way we are uh, we can be healthy if the planet is also sick so it's it's um it's a very global it's a very global perspective which can be overwhelming but if we have that in in mind our daily work can also be um, streamed to the the good direction i believe um the the team that i've been talking to you it's a very different uh, all sorts of uh, uh, professionals we have producers of course um um company uh, company administrators artists uh, pedagogues researchers um intellectuals from the academies and also um uh, many other people from different sectors other than culture that perpass this um the the ongoing programs of every edition so the structure of the the festival uh, has had first had this four axes it was the the shows the international shows because it is an international festival the first goal was to bring really companies from all over the world to sao paulo and then later on three years after the launch of the the festival we launched also the brazilian platform uh with the intent to internationalize the brazilian performing arts because we saw in many different festivals that the amount of brazilian shows at the time it was 2016 uh were very little uh, brazilian shows that were running and through other festivals so the idea was to call programmers uh to see the brazilian shows and that we implemented and, and we had three editions of uh, from the last three years yeah before 2020 and then we have an axis of reflective activities which are called uh, the lectures and the round tables um and then we have also the pedagogical access which is uh, workshops and artistic residencies and master classes and then uh, now we have a, a fifth access which is the digital uh, access the meet plus um which is the i get to, i get to it in a minute <laughs> let's go back so that's the structure of the the festival I come from a different uh, come from an audiovisual background I've worked in cinema I also worked work still with music and I'm also an actress uh so I was doing the the editing of this all this video material that we had complied from the seven uh, at each edition I would edit like a one video of what was the 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 edition and i got to see all this material because of course during the festival i could i could only see the shows not all of them but i couldn't see all the things that were happening there were over 80 activities um, from this uh, reflective and pedagogical axis and then while i was editing i could see it and i saw the value of this uh, material so this has to be uh, publicized this has to be the, uh, available for people so I started creating this idea of uh, a platform that we could uh, make this video archive available much earlier than <laughs> much before we knew what was going to happen to us. So uh, I, part I took place I took uh, place in the International Festival Academy that happened here in Parachi, in the city next to the sea, beautiful one, uh, in 2016, and I 
I came with this, all these ideas that probably the people that are participating in this atelier will come out of here uh, with the same. So I went out very full of ideas and I put everything in a notebook and I start preparing the project, what was called the Meet TV. Because I always loved the, the format of TV, although I think it is used very badly. <laughs> But I think to, to get this access to everybody is, is something that's really appealing to me. So I put, I put the, the project and also during this course, I understood that it was very important for us to get to know our public, that we had um, about 20,000, 25,000 people um, in, presentially in the festival, each edition. And we didn't know who these people were because we didn't have um, enough tools to understand what the public was. So I thought this uh, virtual platform could give us this opportunity, let's say, as an exchange for this material that we would make us accessible to also uh, get the people's uh, data, let's say, what age and where from to see if we were actually achieving the... the um, farther places of the city, uh, not only the, the people that were living in the center. So when we this talks about time, I completely agree. Time to plan and time to develop um, while also in the air. So we could have started before. The project was ready, but of course, a theater festival is an expensive enterprise, especially when the euro for one real is seven to one. So we also wanted to invite in, uh, European companies and the, the prices of the fees and all, all that. So this was always something that was our priority was in the shows. So when COVID hit us, uh, the project was ready to go, to start at least. Um, we had this first opportunity because three days uh, for the end of uh, 2020 edition, the theaters got shut down. We had audience waiting in the theater, in the venues. We had four shows set up in different venues um, why, when they said, okay, we are closing. So it was a big stress. And of course, in the, um, that's, that's really the bad. <laughs> we, were, we, were, um, we had different reactions from the artists. We were actually in, in disbelief Nobody really believed that was happening. It was like um, the first day was like, are they crazy? What is this? Why to close? This is where everybody's waiting and have audience here. Um, so some act artists also reactly, reacted uglily. <laughs> it was, um, it was a, and different than European governments, what I heard, we had a struggle to convince the city hall to pay the artists. Um, so in the end, we had to do, um, we had to show the, the sh we had to show every piece online. That was the condition for them to pay the artists. So again, it was an opportunity to do the online screenings. And, and then we, we saw that we got feedback. We got over 2000 people to see these online screenings. So it was a confirmation that the project could could go right, the, the, the Meet TV project that became the Meet Plus, because Meet Subish had already taken Meet TV in the name. <laughs> but um, so I called my uh, the, the director of the International Theatre Festival of Sao Paulo, both of them, and, uh, Guilherme Marques and Antonio Araújo, and I said, OK, this is the time for the project to come uh, to come true. So um, what, my, um, what can I say else? Wow, the, the ugly most certainly in our case is our president because, um, well, it, it's, it's been very hard and struggling. We had already problems with censorship that we had to overcome. And now, of course, fascists, fascists also think this as an opportunity also see this as an opportunity. So we have to be very careful because people, of course, when they all said, no, we shouldn't stay at home. We should, uh, we should just continue our lives and get to work. 
we, the artists, the, the, and all the people that were uh, taking care, wanting to take care of lives, uh, we had to be the opposite. We had to say, okay, we stay at home. We're not going out anywhere. We're going incentive, to incentivate people to stay, to, to be. So we had to give them also, we felt that this um, platform was also an opportunity for people to be at home and to get um, access to culture and to new um, discussions. So that's what we have been doing. But I don't believe that's the only um, way out in this, in this era. I started to remember my times of Art Academy and other artists and students that were already researching in 2005 uh, ways of this, um, how do you call it? Uh, uh, like that the, you don't get direct contact with the audience but you have something that is in the middle of the art and the audience. So there were a lot of research uh, regarding, say, public space art and how it doesn't have to be, I mean, they, they would put the art there and the people would interact as they are passing through the street. So that doesn't require mm -hmm. like a lot of people together at the same time, for instance. Uh, and I also think theater has survived many other pandemics before. This is not the first one. We are going to be through this. And, uh, and this is not what concerns me. What concerns me is that we take this opportunity to the right way, that we really see this sickness, this disease as a disease that oh, a global way, not only the, the, the COVID, but all the sickness that we are involved and in, how we can be healing um, elements as artists and as programmers, how we can, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. Thank you very much for having me. Great, Natalia. Thank you for being with us. Um, since you had to get up so early in the morning in Sao Paulo to share your thoughts with us. So thank you again. Thank you. So for the next little while, we're going to have a little bit of a facilitated conversation with the panelists um, and myself and I will throw some questions out and um, maybe invite those of you who are part of the panel to, to respond, but also have invited the participants in the atelier to pose questions in the chat group as well, and then I'll forward those. But maybe just to start off, um, for Victor's, um, I suppose traditionally festivals have been seen very much as ends in themselves. The festival is the end. And to some extent, COVID-19 has kind of shifted the festival as a means to something else. Um, and in your presentation, you were talking very much about how the festival, your festival has moved beyond being a festival framed in a particular time to now having a broader kind of impact that maybe went beyond the time framework in which that festival operated. And it's something that, that Shai Dill referred to in his presentation last night as well. And I just wondered whether that might be something that you know, persists in your particular festival or will you revert to the festival as being the end if that ever was the case? Uh, most definitely not is my answer to that question because a festival is a festival and my country has several cultural institutions that work year long. There is a power and um, there is a, there's an Icelandic word called slagkrafter, which means like the power of impact of, um, um, of a festival which is limited to a certain period. And we missed that from this edition of the festival. To stretch it over a full year is not making the best use of our resources, for sure not, but it was absolutely necessary this time around, and we learned a lot from it. But we're very much returning to the three-week festival format that we had before. But I, I would like to add actually something that I, I wanted to, to say in my presentation. Um, and a key word for me now is responsibility. And um, to and thank you, um, other panelists here, for your presentations, which were very inspiring, all coming from these different directions. But I, 
responsibility is something that I'm, um, has really been um, something that I've had to think a lot about. And the responsibility of having public money, not just in this state of crisis, but uh, always. What do you do with this money, which has been, actually it is part of people's wages in the country. This is tax money. This is money people have worked hard for. And I, I really uh, felt that we needed to do everything in our power to provide people with culture and art in this um, terrible situation. Um, and it was our absolute responsibility, but it was also our responsibility to do this safely and not to put anyone at risk, neither our artists or our audiences. Um, and taking that into the future, um, I think this is going to be an, uh, an even stronger um, power in uh, our work. It's, it's also responsibility of having the platform to curate something. And uh, um, part of our new strategy is going to involve a lot more of extending that power, sharing that power with our artists and audiences. And I've, I, yeah, so I think we've learned a lot, but we're nef definitely not going back to uh, not doing this uh, like this again if, if we don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just to, to, to um, pick up on something you've said, um, I was wondering about traditionally or historically how much market research have you done? How much have you researched your audiences in terms of what it is that they want and so on? And I wondered if you've done any of that kind of audience research over the last period to see what is it that they fear most, what is it, under what conditions might they return to a festival, how to, have they responded to things that have gone online and the like? We have very little has gone online. On our, we have very much said we're a live arts festival and we're going to um, deliver a live arts festival, so very few things have been online. We did research around um, the Art Gifts project, that's about it really. And um, it was overwhelmingly positive, and people really felt safe, and they felt that we were taking um, uh, taking all precautions. Um, but uh, unfortunately, no, we haven't had. We don't really have the resources to do serious market research, and this is one of the issues we're actually working on. But it's um, it's so necessary to gather this information and document this period for. Uh, a us to be able to learn more from it in the future. So you hit a sore spot there, Mike. <laughs> okay, I'll move on from you then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But thank you, thank you for that. I'll, I'll make it back with a few more questions uh, a little yeah. bit later, yeah. Pictus. But maybe this will go on to, to Rania. Um, Rania, you were talking about, uh, and, and thank you for sharing, you know, just how your festival has kind of been under threat in the past and, and uh, the challenges that you've encountered in the past. I just wanted to ask maybe like quite a little naive question. Being based in, in East Jerusalem, I take it, how, how accessible is your festival? How, how, many, how many Jewish folk attend your festival and participate in the festival, if at all? Yes, um, actually organizing a festival in uh, Jerusalem is a mission impossible for us Palestinians. Uh, we face several uh, restrictions uh, on using uh, places, organizing events, inviting international artists, being able to access at the airport and come to a Palestinian uh, festival, or even having Palestinian audience coming from cities around Jerusalem. If, if you don't have information about Jerusalem, just to give you an idea, there's tens of military, Israeli military checkpoints around the city. There's an apartheid and separation wall around the city, which forbid and will not allow any Palestinian holding Palestinian ID to come and participate as an artist or an audience in our Jerusalem festival. Uh, the problem is as well, to get access to international artists as well coming uh, to Jerusalem. Our festival is open for all. We do not practice any kind of censorship against anyone, regardless of its gender, of origin, of its uh, religion, of its color, 
so everyone is welcome to our festival as long as they respect our event and our principles and our mission of organizing the festival, which is promoting arts and culture and as well preserving our Palestinian cultural identity. So uh, this is the job that, uh, that we do since 1995 until today. It is not easy at all. We've been attacked. A literature festival has been stopped and we've been arrested for organizing a literature festival. An opening of the festival was banned with a military order from the Israeli occupation. We had to move the festival to the French Cultural Center and the British Council because they are the funders of, of, of this uh, event. Several concerts were banned as well. International artists were arrested at the airport and sent back to their countries. And as well, no Palestinian artists from Gaza or Jenin or from Ramallah uh, can access to, to our festival. In fact, that was going to be my next question. How accessible is your festival to people from Gaza, for example? And you've just answered it, but so I wanted to answer uh, ask the, the, the follow-up question, which is how has technology and the use of digital platforms helped you to provide access to your festival to people who traditionally have not been able to come to your festival? Well, this is a good question. I just want to go back to the Gaza uh, issue as well. This is an area which has been closed for more than 10 years, people have no access. They cannot go out from Gaza. We cannot go to Gaza. Artists cannot travel. They cannot perform in Jerusalem or in Ramallah. So it is a small jail closed on people, even for health and uh, any hospital needed, they cannot go out for uh, medical assistance as well. Um, we, we, we are not really strong on, on the technical issues. I mean, for that reason, we didn't take the initiative of organizing a festival online. We already face a problem of, of having audience coming to our, our festival personally and attend the events with the limited uh, area we are working on. So many people do not have computers or networks or internet uh, some of them were studying because schools were online. Some of them, they have four or five kids at home and they have only one computer on one phone to use for these issues. So we didn't really concentrate on doing our festival online because we felt this, the main aim of, of the festival is to have the people coming to Jerusalem and be with us and attend this festival and give us as well hope in order for us to steadfast in, 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 in the city as well. So technology is not really good uh, for us. Uh, even us at Yabus, it wasn't easy for us to do some uh, events, film screenings or storytelling and so on, but it was easier technically than organizing a festival or a concert or, 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 or something else. Oh, no, thank you for that. I just want to move on to Faisal because in a way Faisal what you were describing earlier kind of resonates with what Rania has been talking about because it's not as if COVID-19 has presented your particular festivals with the first challenges that your festivals have encountered. In fact, it's like an ongoing challenge that you experience. And earlier on, Faisal, you mentioned that we're all in the same boat. Um, you know, we've all experienced this together. And, and I think at a previous atelier, in fact, someone said, we're all in the same storm, but we are in different boats. <laughs> Some people <laughs> have tankers and huge ocean liners and other people have dinghies. So in order for us to really cope with the storm, we have basically things are kind of quite different in Uganda and Palestine as they are in Reykjavik, for example. So I wanted to, to, to ask you, um, in your understanding, you were saying that, you know, you've kind of began to find out who your friends were. In this idea of international solidarity at this time, what are the kinds of things that you would hope people from elsewhere would provide you with some act of solidarity? What would that mean for you in this particular time? Practically. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think maybe um, we just have to think about where does it come from, this solidarity that we are seeking or we would wish to seek. 
for me, um, as, as I said again, um, there is no one to blame, uh, whether if someone is helping you or not, because we are in the same storm, different boats, as you say. But I, I think I, what, I, what, I, what I got to learn out of it is that there is a syndrome that, um, that is kind of um, I, I taken maybe both sides. There is a funding syndrome or a support syndrome where the, the giver is kind of gotten comfortable with giving and the receiver has also gotten comfortable with receiving. We, are, we, the receivers, again from my context, we are always expecting to be given. And we've not managed to come up with strategies that would kind of um, help us in times of uh, like this, or even when there are no times like this, in any time. So we find ourselves expecting, and then the, the, the giver also finds themselves expecting to give, that if you don't ask, they are like, why are you not asking? If you ask, why are you asking? So then you're, you're caught in this dilemma. And I think I've had these conversations many times. Uh, m one of my uh, frustrations in terms of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, support structure, or funding syndrome structure, is always um, a people expecting that you are always going to get money to do something, to do a workshop, for example, but you cannot invest in infrastructure, not knowing that where, where, where I come from, as I was saying, that what is our biggest problem? Do we analyze that? Do we assess, like, you know, when we look at our audiences, the artists we support, the, the industry that we are trying to develop, what does it need? Does it need workshops or does it need space? And then the conversation starts, oh, spaces are closing in Europe. Don't you see that there is a crisis? So you cannot support it, you cannot. So I, I really think we need to reinvent, to, to restart the conversation, to look at our context. As we say, we are in the same storm in different boats. So meaning certain boats are stronger, others are not. And they might need certain different elements that need to be addressed. So in my context, where I, where I come from, we don't need money for workshops. We need money for infrastructure. And that conversation doesn't go well with our friends. So we need to start realizing that if we want to help each other and we want to grow a sector that needs to be grown, we need to address issues that need to be addressed. And this comes in for the, because uh, you know, thinking about around the, uh, the, the young organizers and, and programmers who are here, I think it's important to think around what challenges are there and what could be the solutions because sometimes we can only look at what we can do and not think not have a holistic view we are fortunate enough from uganda that we we as a small organization can have a, 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 a mandate that is as much as the, what the government can do and because we try to think further than that so there is for me it's all about uh thinking and really contextualizing things and making sure that we are not all going to be asking for the same things, but we have different needs, yeah. Yeah, I think that what you're touching on um, refers or re will resonate with the panel that we're doing tomorrow on how do we have festivals and how do we create art in a context of, of inequality. So kind of looking forward to that. But, um, Faisal, I'm going to come back to you with a couple more questions later. I just want to maybe go on to Natalia. And by the way, we um, we'll have about another nine minutes left for this panel. And then, um, because it's been live streamed, and then after that, we may invite people who are part of the Zoom to continue to kind of engage with the panelists as well. So I just wanted to ask Natalia, um, the festival that you run is very close to my heart as a playwright. Um, and I wanted to ask a couple of questions, actually. The extent to which you're going online um, and displaying theater online, how much of that have you been able to monetize? Because that's kind of one of the challenges and one of the questions that's related to this particular discussion. The new business models that are arising out of these new conditions, have you been successful in monetizing online theater? Well, I, th I take this opportunity to thank our sponsors then, <laughs> because we have <laughs> we have been able to to make the um, 
because uh, we had the support from the Italian Culture Institute, from the um, British Council, um, from the uh, Proovesia, and from ASUS, um, and also uh, 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 cultural support from other um, companies that have been um, that really uh, believed in the in the project actually because they really put the money in the project. Uh, of um, of Meet Plus, uh, the idea is that we uh, well first of all in during this crisis we thought not to charge for any tickets so it was all free because the idea was really to um, give the people the opportunity to stay at home and get in contact with culture that was the main goal so we had to find support to be able to do that without charging any tickets. And the companies were also very uh, understand, understanding uh, on our uh, purpose. But I think there are many ways to monetize the uh, digital platform. Uh, one of them being uh, such as Netflix is doing or other many, uh, I, can, I can even um, tell you the, let me get here. Uh, th there are many other different uh, approaches like this in, in theater, not many, actually some, um, for instance, the scenario, uh, for instance, the Broadway HD, for instance, the uh, Stage Russia, uh, so there are a few uh, models that we have been researching and took uh, ideas from, but the idea was at first not to charge the tickets, not the, the, the subscription. So we didn't monetize anything besides what we got from sponsors. And I still think because this is a di digital platform and has um, this um, appeal uh, that other companies may uh, be able to uh, fin finance this enterprise just by having their uh, logos or other kinds of uh, counter um, actions. But yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> and um, who do you think, who, whose responsibility is it uh, to provide the technical support for theater makers to present their work online in an effective way? Certainly from our experience here in South Africa, what has happened over the last while is that many people have gone online uh, but you've got from people using a cell phone to people who've had multi cameras and so on. And many people who consume things online have access to Showmax and Netflix and Amazon and the like. And so great production values that they are able to access. So sometimes the theater that we offer online do not have similar kind of production values. So the question is, if a festival goes online, Whose responsibility is it to make sure that what is presented is of sufficient quality to compare and compete with other things that audiences might have access to? Yeah, the, we have here in, in Brazil, SESC, it's a culture institution that they, they get their half public, half private, and they are being able to offer the places, the theater, the technicians, the cameras, the sound, and they are uh, they have been doing uh, weekly uh, show presentations as such. We have a SESC as partners in the, in, the, in the festival, not in the platform yet. But so because we didn't have the resources, the curatorship of this uh, program had to take in consideration what, kind, what, what were the works that actually could... Um, yeah, could be seen online, could be seen through this uh, 2D dimension, uh, the, the, this, this format, because not all of them could. And of course, uh, we, we, we couldn't uh, give this, uh, not only because of technical uh, or financing problems, but also because we really didn't want anyone to go out and, and, and to have the responsibility because we didn't have the resources to do it in the secure way. Uh, to test everyone, to, you know, all the secure ways that you're doing the atelier over there, I can see. Um, we didn't have the means to do it. So, uh, especially because we're also working with international companies. So what we did is really to 
take this moment to, to program things that were already made, uh, well filmed and could be seen through this format without any problems. We also had one artist that had already been researching uh, the virtual sexual reality and she made a work that had to do with that and you had to watch it through this platform and was very specific. So that uh, is an example, but of course not every artist is interested in working with, with uh, digital. So I think the responsibility to be, to answer you, I think uh, it would be ideal if the responsibility came from the festival, came from the pro production of the festival that we could support this kind of, um, of um, technic technical side, but since we couldn't, then we had to work with what we could, what was possible. <laughs> sure. So, so maybe just to, 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 uh, con to continue, because we are talking about these digital platforms, I want to maybe ask Rania and Faisal as well. Um, certainly Faisal, in an African context, most people access the internet or digital platforms through their mobile phones. Um, and Rana, you were talking about people having very limited access through computers and the like in the family and, and so on. So if one does go the online route, because that's what COVID-19 might have um, obliged companies to do. Um, and if the primary way in which people are accessing content is through their mobile phones, um, is how sustainable is that, do you think, for the distribution of theater or the arts? Um, in the future. Do you think that that's acceptable or do you think it's just a momentary thing? Do you think something else needs to happen? What is your kind of thinking around that? Faisal maybe first? Um, yeah, I think uh, 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 from a Ugandan perspective it's quite challenging because um, of course many people consume uh, content now on their mobile phones. We're doing our, we're doing our online edition of Doa Doa this year and we look at the statistics and we found out like 68% of the of our content is consumed on mobile phones. Uh, then you, but uh, you also realize how long do they watch, you know, uh, then you see that the cost of data like in Uganda is so expensive uh, that it makes it so difficult for people to really enjoy the entire production. For example, if it's more than five minutes, then people are not gonna really use their entire data for that. So that doesn't really come well with, with theater because theater tends to be long. Um, then also the other thing is that we have a, a challenge now that most of our social media platforms are blocked. So you have to either use VPN, which consumes data for you to be able to access Facebook or Twitter. And that also makes it very difficult for people to use, uh, to enjoy your content on, uh, on, on uh, social media which is one of the most easiest way to uh, distribute it. But what have we done? We thought, we, thought, we, we thought of a solution, how to work with artists and not, not necessarily on to the digital. Uh, we came up with an idea and we say that, uh, how can we support artists in this, in this period? So we, we came up with the budget and we paid, uh, we told artists we are paying you for a gig in the future when you can perform, but we are gonna give you half of the, of the, of the money and then the half, you'll get it when the gig comes. And then we booked them around East Africa. So we invited all these festival organizers and, and, and event organizers and we told them, can you book this artist? Can you book this exhibition? And then they said, yes, okay. We are going to pay the artist, slot them in. When, they, when, when, when everything is back to normal, make sure they perform. We pay them 50%, we'll give them the 50% when they, are, when they really perform. And I think this is one way because we know all these other avenues are not easy. So this is one of the easiest way that we are trying to uh, support the artists. Thanks. Thank you, Rania. Yes, um, I'll, uh, I'm, I don't have uh, different uh, uh, answers. Uh, Faisal. Uh, actually, we did uh, just want to mention that we did a market research in July last year uh, to check uh, how people are reacting and how they are uh, engaging uh, with our programs and activities. To be honest, we had big participation from people, uh, but it was at the beginning of, of the corona. 
later on starting july and august people are fed up with staying uh, connected uh, with uh, their laptops and mobiles and um, they were not so much interested in in uh, continuing attending events online this is first second the quality of events that was presented to the audience was not good actually some people started uh, doing um, uh, theater plays on uh, on social media because it was not uh, recorded or uh, filmed or uh, from a technical point of view the sound the uh, the light and so on it wasn't so attractive to audience so people did not enjoy it and they didn't continue even watching these uh, events online technically speaking as i said we are poor in this matter and we couldn't utilize what is available in in the way that can keep the audience attached and in relation uh, for the whole year uh, with us. The second issue is um, how much time people can spend online. I mean, we spend so much time online on Zoom and meetings and so on. Our kids spend uh, six, seven hours on school uh, learning uh, online and they are fed up with it. They couldn't get so much uh, from the six, seven hours. So when I tell them, let's sit and watch a play or a musical or, oh, mom, I don't want the, it's too much for me after six, seven hours just to watch my, uh, my uh, this is online. It doesn't have the same effect as we go and so on. Besides, as I said, uh, so many people do not have smartphones or uh, laptops and so on just to be connected all the time to these kind of events, just they are waiting and watching and 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 uh, and uh, so on. So quality, time, and how much do you enjoy it? I mean, to be honest, I couldn't enjoy any play online because I want to feel the whole atmosphere in the hall. Um, uh, and the young generation are so much concentrating on something fast. They need something very fast to be uh, presented to, to them. So we have to deal with all these issues while um, planning, rearranging, restructuring, and thinking about how we can work during uh, the corona and after the corona uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think what you've raised is, is a question that I'd like to maybe end this particular panel with and pose it to all of you maybe starting with Victor's, the extent to which you think the last year um, has not only impacted on festivals and how festivals have had to reconstruct and redesign themselves, but the extent to which you think that what has happened over the last year and particularly having to go onto digital platforms will impact on the aesthetics of the art forms themselves. So in the way that people have consumed, in the amount of time that they spend consuming, um, the amount of data that it takes to consume and so on, how will, and the technical skills required to present something that they're consuming online, how much do you think the form itself will change? Will people in future need at training schools to be trained in making theatre, particularly for digital platforms? Um, and if so, what are the skills that are needed for that? If people are only consuming five minutes of theater, are we going to see a genre of five minute theater um, and so on? You know, So I just wondered what um, you as panelists thought about the impact of the last year and going into the digital space will have on our actual forms. Thank you, Victor. I, yes. I think it's um, already having an impact. I think, um, just to go back to what uh, Rania said about uh, the quality, um, we, um, I th I th there was already a good example actually from the National Theatre in England and from the Metropolitan and other big institutions that had the resources and have the resources to really create high quality digital content in the terms of recording um, live performance to be then projected to screens either in theatres or cinemas or or on computer screens and this is this is the, the prime example this is the bar it's really high for for um, um, this high quality level we already have the technology we had it before covid to to do this and 
it is. I've I've attended some of these in cinemas, and they are really um, enjoyable. And I was surprised as a theatre director how much I enjoyed watching it because it, the the cinema work itself, the camera work is so um, good that it you really feel like you're there, and you get like an, a, um, a heightened experience even of of the performance. So uh, I think we're going to want that, and that's going to survive, and that's going to continue, and we're probably going to see more of that. I think with the, the raised demands also on festivals not to, to, to always think about the ecological footprint, I think like large-scale symphonies, large-scale ballets, we're not going to see them touring as much, um, or I hope not, actually, because I think that's... Um, a waste because these type of performances can really be um, uh, delivered through these um, high quality uh, recordings. Another thing that I think is already happening as well and I can see um, experiments with is that I think this it's either the digital either works on this high quality level or it works on this very intimate level which is almost like a personal encounter with the artist performing and I um, um, there are I've seen experiments of this that work really well really powerful um, performances but it's also something that you where it almost feels uh, it's like participatory we need to engage with the material so it's personal and engaging and um, um, you something that you di directly engage with and react to or this high quality. I think this is the way where we seem to be going. Um, and I think both have a purpose in the future, COVID-free future or a COVID future for the next year, both have a purpose. It's really tricky with the in-betweens. It's really tricky to um, say, oh, we're doing a, a streaming of this and we only have, but we only have one camera and really bad sound, but we're gonna do it because it's so important. I really think it's not worth doing it if you don't have the resources to do it really well. Um, but then again, you can do really low-cost things that are intimate and personal. Just, just while you're there, Victor, uh, it is interesting you're talking about the National Theatre Productions and the like, and you're talking about them being um, productions that are filmed in front of audiences. Um, there are also other productions that have been filmed with great technical facilities um, without there being an audience. Do you think there's a difference between the two? Um, you know, we, f coming from the theatre world, for us, the live encounter between the performers and the audience is kind of what makes theatre and dance. This is why we say that no performance is ever the same. And I think the quality of the experience for the audience watching a piece of theatre that is filmed in front of a live audience, is it significantly different to watching a piece of theatre that is filmed without a live audience? I'm not so sure, actually, but I, I, um, but actually, the way the National Theatre has done it is really you feel included in that audience, don't you? And um, and I've seen those performances um, in a cinema with other people, so I'm actually experiencing it with an audience. Well, I've seen a couple online also, but but the po more powerful ones are the ones where I'm experiencing it with an audience in Iceland. Um, so uh, I'm not sure actually there is a huge difference unless it's done in this way that you really, you know, you walk in with your, you know, they give you, they have all these tricks, don't they, where they, where they make you feel like you are actually entering the space and you're in the space. Maybe, maybe there is a difference, but uh, really the, the uh, sharing of space and sharing of molecules in the air, there is n nothing that substitutes that ever. Yeah, I think I was asking just, in terms of for future training, if um, you know going onto the digital platforms are is going to be impacting on the form, then what is the kind of training that will be required at training schools at a later stage? What are the yeah. skills, technical and otherwise, that people would need to yeah. acquire and the like? You know, so yeah, mm. yeah. I think there is, of course, there is a there is a the the performers. It's it's an, it's a crossover between film and theatre, isn't it? And and in that sense, the live audience does make a difference, of course, to the performance on stage. And I, um, yes, I think for sure, but I think it's, again, I think it's already happening. I think um, theatre uh, education now it really includes film uh, in, in, you know, most theatre schools are including yeah. that a lot in their work anyway. 
So, yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. Rania, um, how would you respond? Well, actually, on on different uh, levels, I cannot compare ourselves in Palestine with with uh, with you or with uh, European countries or even with African countries because each one of us has its own situation, its infrastructure, technicalities, equipment, how people react uh, to uh, to a specific issue. I was really afraid that Corona will create a different aspect or a different kind of arts and culture, uh, different uh, styles as well, and how people will react to it. I was so afraid about how do people will go out again and attend and be uh, with us in, in, in theater. Um, there's so many question marks about these issues. And for how long could we cope with this uh, situation? In our situation in Palestine, we are a bit far away from moving uh, our events or our festivals or our concerts to a digital platforms uh, for different aspects. As I said, um, infrastructure, technicalities, equipment, uh, capacity, um, uh, artist uh, reaction on this matter, uh, losing the audience as well and losing the spirit of, of the event uh, itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm still confused about this matter, but I'm, I'm sure that in Palestine, digital platforms are not the alternative uh, for a long period to uh, uh, festivals or events uh, that we organize. I mean, I don't want to see everything as a film. I mean, even uh, theater or uh, dance or music and, and so on. Films is a different uh, atmosphere. I mean, uh, you can see it on a small screen, bigger screen, the large screen at the cinema, but the reaction and and the, the relation between the audience and the artist on stage, musicians, dancer, theater plays, and so on, is totally different than watching it on a screen, small or big. Or um, so I'm 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 a bit confused about this yeah. issue, and I hope it will not mm. continue forever. The situation. Mm. And to ask, just in terms of the theatre in Palestine, how much technology is used within theatre? So a normal kind of theatre production, would they use film? Would they use, uh, you know, projections and the like? In other words, just to see how theatre in Palestine has evolved in, from a more kind of traditional um, performance. Well, uh, the theater production in Palestine have been uh, evolving and been uh, active as well, and there, especially the, the last five years, um, there have been so many new productions uh, using different, uh, different technologies as well, uh, and mixing between uh, uh, image uh, and, and music and acting uh, on stage. The problem that we faced during the corona that most of the plays or theater plays were not recorded or filmed in a proper way. So uh, the presentation or uh, putting all these plays online with a very bad uh, quality uh, affected uh, the, the, um, the action and reaction of the audience, if, if they enjoyed it, they loved it, they, uh, they interacted and, and, and so on. But theater in general in Palestine uh, is using different technologies and has been uh, uh, directing as well the work using different uh, elements uh, on stage, which is, uh, which is uh, becoming very uh, familiar with plays that we, we attend and watch uh, in Palestine. Especially lately, there, there has been um, young uh, a generation of directors, producers, and actors on stage who have used different uh, new issues that has been improving uh, the production of theater in, in, in Palestine. Hmm. Cool. 
Great, thank you. Um, Faisal, anything from your experience in Uganda over the last year that has shown that COVID-19, um, people going online, that those kinds of things are going to be impacting on the aesthetics of the art forms that are done in Uganda? Um, yeah, I think uh, what we realized immediately when everyone was moving on to online, uh, we realized that those that had invested in their platforms before, that they had the setup, uh, good sound studios, the artists who were always doing concerts online, they really benefited so much, uh, not only in terms of keeping their audience and uh, delivering quality work, but also in terms of revenue. And uh, I think now the future, uh, when it comes to you know, capacity building, definitely, uh, I think most of us are now uh, budgeting and planning to invest in all online uh, content. Uh, what we're doing now is that we are also setting up our own channels, not, not just to deliver content online, but also to earn as a source of revenue, because we see many people are earning a lot of money from YouTube uh, views and, and, and adverts and stuff like that. So as, as organization in our context, we see that as an opportunity. If we, if we invest now and start building our audience, we'll be earning as we broadcast our content. And on the other hand is also like, we, we have an opportunity of uh, when we have our festivals to earn from both the physical presence of, uh, of audiences as well as those that cannot make it online to be able to also enjoy our work simultaneously. So the, the opportunities are there. We just need to invest in the capacities. Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting model. So you might actually have your, Faisal, you might have your, your YouTube channel subsidizing your live performances. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, Natalia, the final word to you. Well, I, I think we're gonna actually um, increase the theater attendance after all this is done. I think people will want desperately to go back to the theater. We're gonna, every, we're gonna take this. Uh, we're gonna take this as a, as what it really is actually a present. You know, the presence of being together in this present which is, I, I hear myself from the room, if I can the sound. Um, I think- oh, There is uh, a bit of an echo, sorry. Um, yeah. It's the hybrid thing. <laughs> Indeed, yes. But I yeah, think- that's better. Well, I, I just wanted to, to say about the, this digital, the digital platform where uh, we open, uh, exactly with this idea that soon, I don't know when, but soon we're going to go back. We're going to go to the venues. We're going to see theater. We're going to be together and we're going to, uh, this is coming. And what we can value for now in this moment is actually uh, archive material. You know, it can take time to, to look back at the history of theater and also shows that are not running anymore. Shows that have been um, run, you know, we had the, the last presentation of, um, of um, Jesus, that's really, I forgot the name in English. Oh, the, the, never mind. I'll, for, I'll remind, remember later, but we had also artists like uh, Kate Mitchell that brought uh, Miss Julie uh, show to, to our festival. And there is already a connection with cinema and theater and they are like filming and you never know if, if what you're seeing is what's actually being filmed there or, you know, if it's a recording. And we had also another artist that came with a, a show at the same uh, period that was Julia, the same coming from the same novel, but a different work, also working with video. There are many artists that have been working with video in theater. We had also a show of the encounter of a Complicité, um, Simon McBurney, that made a show that was basically, you had to put the phones and you had to hear um, with this multi-directional uh, microphone, you could really be inside the show. It was a, a very powerful, also digital experience. 
so I think there will be artists that will fall in love with this and create media and create work and, um, and take this to the extreme. Uh, but I think also that there will be more people that will want to, to go to the theater, maybe people that have never been before and just because now they can, uh, they, they will feel moved. Uh, and one thing about audience that I think it's important because I really believe that the power of the festivals is that we, we gather people that are being um, bound with, uh, with creation, with art. So everybody's really moved. So when you put them together after the show, during the show, there, there are connections that happen there and things that happen there that are very special because people are already in an open mindset, moved by what they've seen. So this doesn't happen. Of course, you'll be, you feel moved at home when you see it, you don't share it. And this is a loss for sure. Um, but I think, I think it's, um, I think we have much to see in the, in the physicality of theater to come. I think it will be even more radical, the physicality, once we can. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Natalia. I've um, been doing some research locally in South Africa, just to, you know, among theatre makers um, to determine the impact of COVID-19 on their work and on their mental health, which I think is a very important thing that Faisal kind of raised. And then also on audiences. Um, and it's been very interesting because audiences are really keen to get back. Um, um, and they're very supportive as well of the theatre, of the theatre scene. And, um, but you know, the, the, I, uh, one of the questions asked was, um, what prevents you from going to theater most at the moment if theaters were opened? Um, and 46% of them said, it's, it's fear of contracting the virus. Um, and uh, another 44% said, well, they would go to the theater if the theater was actually open, but so many theaters have obviously been shut down because gatherings are deemed to be the primary the primary um, vector of the virus. And, and so we're kind of caught in, in these kinds of contradictions in a way, isn't it? All the time, there are these challenges. And I think theater makers are kind of looking at, and production houses are looking for some degree of stability so that they can plan for the future. And audiences are looking for herd immunity and for um, a degree of, of security in the knowledge that, that if they go to the theater, they're not going to be infected. Although so many people go to restaurants and they go to shopping malls um, and, and they come into contact with people a whole lot more than they might in socially distanced kind of theater spaces. So these are some of the struggles that we are having to encounter right now and, and grapple with and, and hopefully overcome. But also at the same time, find models that are appropriate to a future in which pandemics may very well be part of our future. You know, climate change is, is a thing. Um, and we haven't begun to experience the impact of climate change on what it is that we do as, as artists, as festival makers. So this might be, as Victor was saying, a very good time to be slowing down, to be reflecting, to be thinking about what are the different ways in which we continue to do the work that we deem to be important. But more importantly, to be thinking about why it is that we do the work that we do, and then to possibly come up with the most appropriate forms to continue to pursue the vision that we have. But to all of you as panelists, Rania, Victus, Faisal, and Natalia, thank you very much for your excellent participation in this panel. It's been really great to have you. I'm going thank to you hand so back. much. I'm going to hand back to Inga, um, and Inga will basically bring the live stream part of this to an end and let us know what happens afterwards. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So thank you for following us. We will be back tomorrow with a next live stream at 12 CEST Brussels time um, on festivals and inequality and new ways of international collaboration. Um, so that's it for today.